Welcome back. In this video, we can, we're going to look at valuation. And this time, instead of dividends base, we're going to look at free cash flow base. First, remember that the value of an investment is the sum of the present value of all future cash flows. So this is a formula that you have seen before. Um, and we're going to use Excel to perform the calculation. So we'll use the MPV function in Excel, which implements this formula. Once again, we need to take into account the continuing value beyond our uh, forecast horizon. And the way we do that is to capture it using a growing perpetuity. Now that we know we have, um, we take into account both free cash flow to all stakeholder, meaning the firm, as well as common equity, we need to be careful about matching cash flows and required return. So basically, the principle is that the discount rate must reflect the risk of the cash flows. So if our cash flow is to equity holders, then we need to use cost of common equity because this is the risk associated with cash flow to equity holders. If we are using free cash flow to all the stakeholders in the firm, then we will use the weighted average cost of capital. Because remember, when we compute the weighted average cost of capital, that take into account cost of debt, cost of preferred stock, cost of non-controlling interest, and cost of common equity. So if the cash flow incorporate all the stakeholders, then the discount rate should also reflect the required return of all the stockholders or all the stakeholders. The other thing that we want to uh, take into account is the, inf the effect of inflation. Again, the same principle applies if you are using real cash flow, meaning cash flow that does not take into account inflation, then we will use a real discount rate. And we talk about uh, the relationship between nominal discount rate, inflation rate, and real, and real interest rate in uh, the prior chapter. So if we are using real cash flow, we use real discount rate. If we use nominal cash flow, we use nominal discount rate. What do we mean by my nominal cash flow? That means we take into price increases as well as quantity increase. So when we forecast revenue, we expect revenue to go up and revenue can increase either because we sell more products or service more customers, or we charge a higher price. Um, so nominal cash flow will take into account the increase in prices. Uh, the same thing for expenses. Uh, I'll say 99% of the time, forecast is done um, using nominal cash flow, and therefore um, we should use nominal cash flow as well. That's the majority of the case. One thing that may uh, you may already thought about this um, is what happens if cash flow is negative? Because dividends will seldom be negative because if you don't have money, you don't you know you can you can't get money back from the stockholders. Uh, there's no requirement. But cash flow can be negative. Uh, if that happens, we will have to extend our forecast horizon um, to when the cash flows become positive. If that doesn't happen, then um, we either we have to. Uh, if you extend it long enough, um, it should. Otherwise, it's not a valuable investment. So these are the basic principles. Let's take a look at how we how we actually applied it. First, we're going to look at how we apply it to common equity shareholders. Um, I'll abbreviate some uh, terms just so that they are manageable in the equation. So. Uh, this is free cash flow to common equity holders. And V stands for the value for common equity. So the first step is just like we did with dividend, we need to cho choose a forecasting horizon. We'll say this is, we'll forecast for T number of years. And then once we reach the end of the forecasting horizon, we're going to capture all the future free cash flow to equity holders into a continuing value. We'll make the same assumption as we've done before that uh, the, the free cash flow to come equity holders will grow at a constant rate and at that same rate forever. So the continuing value that we capture at the end of year T will be the next year's free cash flow divided by the, this is the cost of 
equity and the growth rate this is the constant growth rate now there are two ways you can estimate this uh, you can simply take the last the free cash flow at the last year of your forecast horizon times one plus the constant growth rate so this is the um, forever constant growth rate for all future free cash flows so the value at the end of the at year zero meaning today of common equity will be the sum of this so um, in excel what we will do is we'll list the free cash flow each year and then at the end of the horizon we have to add up both the free cash flow for that year as well as the continuing value to demonstrate this let's go back to the standing desk example so we're going to continue with the template that we have created um, we'll compute the valuation for uh, standing desk inc and we'll also perform sensitivity analysis every time we do valuation it's really important that we perform sensitivity analysis because there's so many so much uncertainty okay and now uh, when we ended last time, we finished computing all the free cash flows. Next, we're going to click on the next tab. The next page, we will see all the assumptions for valuation. Here are the assumptions. We are given the beta of the firm is 1.2. We know the return on the market, or we have the estimated return on the market, uh, the risk-free rate. We also have an average tax rate and the cost of debt. In addition to that, the analyst has forecasted um, future EBITDA growth because we are using EBITDA as a basis of estimation. Um, in addition to that, um, the analyst also forecasts some other information. Now, this, this is a shortcut. Instead of forecasting uh, all the financial statements, uh, we assume that the, there is a need for reinvestment. So remember when we compute uh, free cash flow, let me go back here. Um, we have um, operating cash flow that will change, right? So this is, um, and as well as capital expenditure. This reinvestment percentage, reinvestment rate captures both, capture both needs for investing in networking capital as well as total, as well as um, fixed assets. And I'll show you how we will um, incorporate that in our calculation. Uh, and then be, the forecast horizon is five years. And beyond the forecast horizon, they expect that the long-term stable growth rate is 3%. And then the long-term reinvestment rate is 50%. So you'll see that the investment reinvestment is relatively high for the next couple of years and then slow down to a long-term stable rate. Let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we need to do is to compute the cost of equity. And that's relatively straightforward. We're going to use the capital asset pricing model. So that's equal to the risk-free rate plus the beta of the stock times, we're not given the market risk premium, we're given the market return. So we have to subtract the risk-free rate from the market return. So the return of market minus the risk-free rate with free rate that give us the market risk premium. So here is our cost of equity. Next, we're going to project um, EBITDA. Next, we we'll need to project uh, EBITDA. We're going to start with the base year. Base year was located in our original forecast or our original statement. So here's EBITDA for year zero. And then we need to times one plus the projected growth rate. The projected growth rate in year one is 45%. Okay. And then year two is going to equal to the EBITDA in year one times one plus the growth rate for year two. Okay. We need to subtract interest expense. Uh, interest expense is equal to, we don't expect to change our uh, borrowing, so we'll assume you'll stay at $130,000 and at the current existing interest rate of 10%. Again, because that is 
a subtraction. We'll make that negative. Um, and then tax. Tax is equal to um, EBITDA because we say this is the tax rate on EBITDA. So this is not the tax rate on taxable income. Uh, typically, you will have um, other, uh, so this is a slightly lower tax rate than you would expect. So that's equal to EBITDA times 35%. The actual tax rate will probably be um, uh, higher for taxable income. So the free cash flow from operation from common equity will be the sum of the above. And then we need to subtract. So this is investing activity. So again, that is a subtraction. So that's negative. Remember, this is all a percentage of free cash flow from operations. So it's a percentage of free cash flow from operations. So equal to what we just computed times the reinvestment rate. And the free cash flow for common equity holder is the sum of these two. And we can copy this to year two. And then Okay, I can see a mistake here because we have EBITDA, so we should be paying tax. And what I did not do is make the tax rate an absolute reference, so I can fix that error. And now we can copy this for the remaining years. So notice that our projected free cash flow is going to be negative for a couple of years, and then you eventually turn positive. To compute the continuing value, we will need to estimate both the free cash flow from operation as well as um, investing activities. There are multiple ways an analyst can go about doing that. Um, one approach, which was, was this, um, very common, is an analyst can simply take the free cash flow uh, for common equity holders and then multiply it by one plus the growth rate and then divide it by the um, difference between the discount rate and the um, long-term growth rate. So we call that approach one. So we will take this times one plus the growth rate and then divide that by the difference between the required return minus the growth rate. So this is a very common approach. Now this approach assumes that it will continue to, the, the firm will continue to reinvest at 65%. However, the analyst in this case suggests that the long-term reinvestment rate is going to be slightly lower because the company is going to slow, the, the long-term growth rate is going to be 3%. So this is 15%. So you notice that there is a relationship between growth rate and reinvestment rate. You have to reinvest to grow. So if your growth rate stay, slows down to 3%, you can probably assume, you should assume that, that you can put back uh, slightly less than uh, what you have been doing. So in this approach, we're going to assume that the long-term growth uh, reinvestment rate is lower. In this case, is um, 50%. So to do that, um, I'm going to use the free cash flow for operations. So to make this a little bit easier, to, I can do this in one of two steps, but I'm going to put the entire formula together first, so pay close attention. So we assume this is going to increase at 1 plus the growth rate. But then we also need to subtract from it our reinvestment rate. So that's equal to this times 1 plus the growth rate times the reinvestment rate. So this is our future cash flow from operations. Subtract from it our 
investing activity. And then we will divide this by the difference between the cost of equity and the future long-term growth rate. So notice that it is a it it makes a huge difference um, and not surprising uh, is almost double because um, here we're assuming that we can continue to grow, uh, but we have to invest reinvest at 65%. Here we assume that we can continue to grow, but and reinvesting only 50%. So that's that's the that's why the two approaches will, will give you a different uh, continuing value. We're going to use approach two in this example, uh, and then the next step is um, the same as what we have done before. We'll compute the total value of cash flow. Um, so that's the free cash flow plus the continuing value. Finally, we'll compute the value of the company today. Uh, the first part of the value is the net present value, the present value of future cash flow. The discount rate is the cost of equity, and then the future cash flow. So this is the present value of all future cash flow. But remember, um, we do have debt, so we have to subtract that from our equity value. So we have to subtract uh, our current liability, our uh, long-term liability of $130,000. So this is the value of the common equity shareholders. To perform sensitivity analysis, we need to take a look at our assumptions and decide which ones do we want to analyze. Uh, we can look at um, one variable at a time or two variables at a time in Excel. I will demonstrate both options. We have shown before that long-term stable growth rate could be a significant factor affecting our value. So let's take a look at that. When we extend our model, we want to make sure that we are not affecting any of the existing formulas. The best way to do that is to add any new elements to your model to the right of the existing and also below. So I'm going to put my sensitivity analysis over here. So our goal is to look at various levels of growth rate. We're going to even entertain the idea that it may be negative. So let's say maybe growth rate is could be negative and see how that will affect um, our forecast. So let's say that is from negative 1% all the way to 5%. So this is the long-term growth rate. And for um, our analysis, we want to look at two things. So we can look at the continuing value as well as the value of SDI, common equity. So we're going to do two um, output variables. So we reference the location in our model. So continuing value is located in cell F28 in, this, in my model. And the value of SDI is located in cell B30. So our first column is the variable we want to analyze. And the next two columns, in fact, you can have as many as you want, uh, are very uh, the, uh, analyzing the impact of changing this variable. So we are looking at the impact on continuing value and also the value of um, the entire com uh, the common shareholders. Once you create the, the table outline, we can highlight the entire table. So that's the table area. And that to perform the analysis, we'll go to table. And then under what if analysis, go data table. In this case, we don't have any row input cell. Our input cell is located in a column. So we only have a column input cell, and that's our long-term growth rate. So our, the long-term growth rate in our model is located in cell B13. Once I select OK, the table will be completed. 
So not surprisingly, what we see, let me format this so it's easier to read, is that as growth rate increases, the continuing value increases and the value of the, uh, comp of the company also increase. So remember, this is the base case. This is the base case, so we'll mark that separate. Uh, and we can I always include um, the base case as part of my sensitivity analysis to make sure that uh, I get what I expect, and indeed I do. So at 3%, I get back the base case. Um, we see that even if the long-term growth rate is negative, the company is not worthless. It's just worth lower. If we analyze one variable at a time, we can look at the impact on multiple variable, variables. We can also look at the impact of two variables at a time, but with Excel, when we do that kind of analysis, our output is limited to one. So let's say we want to perform another sensitivity analysis. Uh, we know that long-term growth rate is an important variable, so we're going to include that. Notice I'm putting my table to the right of my, uh, a new table to the right and below my old table. Uh, that's just to continue our practice of not affecting uh, existing model areas. And now let's take a look at another uh, variable that we think may have an important impact. Uh, it could be market return because market return is subject to economic conditions. So that may change. So we want to look at what happened if the return on the stock market changes. Uh, the base case, remember, is 11.5%. So maybe it will be as low as 8%. And it may go as high as 15%. So now we have our market return, and what we want to know is the impact on, let's say, the value of the firm, which is pretty obvious. The value of the firm is located in cell B30. So when you set up the table area, you want to have the variable that you want to observe changes in across the top and down in the column. Uh, the corner cell contains um, what you are analyzing. So this is the sensitivity of the value that you estimated. To both the long term growth rate and market return. So once again, we want to highlight the entire area. And we go to data, what if analysis, data table. The row input cell, so what is the range in the row is the market return. So we have to put the cell address in our assumption area that contains the market return. And the column input is the long-term growth rate. So this is the long-term growth rate in our model area. Once you press OK, then the analysis will be completed for you. Um, so not surprisingly, the lower the growth rate and the higher the return on the market, the lower the value. So here you can see that even with a low growth rate of negative long-term growth rate and a high market return, much higher than 11.5%, the company's value, of course, will go down. And you can see how much that that impact would be. Uh, so let's look at the base case. The base case is 11.5% and a 3% growth rate. And not so, so again, to make sure that when we check our base case against our base case, it is correct. So we know we are getting the results that we expected. So you can see the two extreme cases. The lowest in our forecast is a little over a million dollars. And the highest is a very low market return and high long-term growth rate. It can be $6.8 million. So that's a six-fold sensitivity. 
it is extremely important to perform sensitivity analysis on all of our um, valuation models because um, the as you can see, the future is full of uncertainty and sensitivity analysis gives us a way to um, measure how strong that impact may be. Next, we're going to apply the free cash flow based valuation model to the entire firm. So this is for all stakeholders of the firm. First, let's again define some terms. FCF is free cash flow to all stakeholders of the firm. And then this is a value of net operating assets. So this is the value of the firm. So this is um, all, uh, all the net operating assets. And then V is the value of common equity, just like we have seen before. The steps are exactly the same. Uh, we choose a forecasting horizon. And then we will capture all the free cash flow beyond the forecasting horizon into a continuing value. Um, we'll compute the continuing value as a um, growing perpetuity. So once again, we can just increase it by one plus the growth rate. Um, the required return here is the weighted average cost of capital. So again, matching cash flow to the discount rate. So the cash flow is free cash flow to all, st all stakeholders. The discount rate is the weighted average cost of capital. And G here is the growth rate for free cash flow to the firm. Uh, the value, the formulas for applying, for computing this is exactly the same. So now we have, um, when we discount the future cash flow, we get the value of net operating assets. So we can use cash flow to the firm, discount it by the weighted average cost of capital, and they'll give us the value of net operating asset. And then if we subtract the value of debt, lease, preferred stock, and non-controlling interest, we end up with the value of equity. Let's take a look at an example to help us illustrate this last um, approach. I encourage you to print out this page or to um, have it side by side on Excel so that um, you can create this model from scratch. So there's no template. Um, you have completed a template, so now you should be quite familiar with what we will be doing. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to encourage you to um, take a look at the data and then see, think about how you will set it up on your own. I hope you have entered all the information that was in the problem. Uh, probably the one thing that you would not have put in is the forecast horizon. It's, a, it's always a good idea to put all your assumptions very clearly. Um, we have a five-year um, forecast horizon. We have um, this, the capital structure is 40% debt, 60% equity. Cost of debt is 10%. Cost of equity is 14%. Uh, tax rate is 40%. So this is all from the problem. So when you read a problem, extract them into Excel and organize it um, in a way that makes most sense to you. The first thing I'm going to compute is the weighted average cost of capital. If you don't have all these, uh, I strongly encourage you to create um, uh, your own nooks so that you can have all the formulas handy when you're creating your model. So the weighted average cost of capital is the weight of debt times the cost of debt times one minus the tax rate. And then plus the weight of equity times the cost of equity. And using my approach, it's easy to see when I make a mistake. Uh, the cost of debt is 10%. So by organizing your um, assumption area clearly, it's much easier for you to um, create your formulas and avoid mistakes. Okay. So we already given 
the free cash flow estimate. So the only thing we have to do is the continuing value. And the continuing value is at the end of our uh, forecast horizon, which is year 12. So that's just equal to our last cash flow times one plus the growth rate divided by the difference between the discount rate, which in this case is the weighted average cost of capital and the long-term growth rate. So here we have our continuing value and that will give us the total free cash flow. And that's just the sum of the cash flow and the continuing value. And once we have that, we can compute the present value of free cash flows to all stakeholders. So once again, we can use the MPV function. Um, the discount rate is the weighted average cost of capital. And here are all the cash flows. So we know this is the present value of free cash flow to all stakeholders, all the value of non-operating uh, net operating assets, or the entire firm. If you add up the value for all the stakeholders, that must be the firm's value. So now we can think of, so what is our liability? Our liability in year eight. And this is, at the beginning of year eight, because this is the present value at the beginning of year eight. So let's be very explicit. It's always a good idea um, to write your label as clearly as possible. How do we determine that? Well, we were given some information. We know that we finance our firm using 40% liability. So if this is the total value, 40% of that will be the value of debt. Um, we know the interest cost because we know the interest rate is 10%. So the interest cost is, we'll assume that it doesn't change. So it will be $3,000. One more thing, it should be negative because interest expense is an outflow. And we, but we also get some tax savings. So you can either, uh, you can do one of two things. I'm going to actually separate the two. Um, tax saving is an inflow, so that will be 40% of our interest. So that's one option. Once again, I forgot to make that absolute. That's one option. So we can have tax uh, interest costs less our tax savings. Or we can compute the after interest costs. So we can do interest costs after tax. So that will mean that it is the uh, normal interest expense. So that's the 10% times 1 minus the tax rate. And of course, you see that it's the same. Again, that's an expense. So we are out $3,000, but we get back $1,200 in tax savings. So our after-tax cost is $1,800. So you can do it either way, and that would be that would be fine as well. Now let's compute the free cash flow to common equity holders. So free cash flow to common equity. Uh, we know that the total free cash flow is 2100 and $3,000 goes to bondholders, but the tax savings belong to the common stockholders. So this is the free cash flow to common equity holders during the forecast horizon. And we can compute the present value of that. So 
so we use but since this is common equity we're going to use the cost of equity as our discount rate so remember matching cash flow to the cost so matching cash flow to the discount rate these are cash flow to common equity so we're going to use the cost of equity so this is our present value of free cash flow to equity holders again only during the forecast horizon so what that means is that um, we can find out how much of the equity holders value can be attributed to the continuing value. So we know that the present value at the beginning of year eight, we know the total value at the beginning of year, year eight is about 75,000. Debt is about 30,000. So the difference must be equity holders. You can also multiply this by 60%. You end up with the same answer. So your total value um, at the beginning of year eight is 40, about $45,000. So let me relabel this for it to be very clear. So this is the value of free cash flow to equity holders during the forecast horizon at the beginning of year eight. So what that means is the implied present value of the continuing value at the beginning of year eight is the difference between the two. So this is the total value. This is the value of the cash flow during the forecast horizon. So the difference must be the value attributed to um, the continuing value. So you can see a majority of the value is part of the continuing value. We can compute the future value of that So we can use the uh, future value formula. So once again, the interest rate is cost of equity. The number of period is five years. That's our forecast horizon. We don't have any payment. The present value is the 42,888. Um, we want to make sure that this shows up as positive. So we'll change the sign on that. We can use the information we have to help us estimate what the implied long-term growth rate is. Now remember that the value of the um, continuing value is equal to the future free cash flow divided by the required return minus the growth rate. Um, and this is supposed to be in T ET plus one, but we don't have that but we do have the free cash flow in year T, so we can use that to um, times one plus the growth rate, right? So this is the future cash flow is in year T. The growth rate is 8%. The required return is 14%. So that's the required return. And the implied value that we computed is the 82,000 578 and the unknown that we are trying to solve is the growth rate so with some algebra we can rearrange this and with some algebra we can rearrange and solve for g so the implied growth rate is the continuing value times the cost of uh, equity in this case minus the last free cash flow uh, divided by the sum of the two. So we can put this formula into Excel. This is our implied long-term growth rate. And this is for free cash flow for equity. So we can take 
Uh, actually, this to be in a parenthesis. So we'll take the the value at time t times the cost of equity. And then minus the free cash flow in the last year divided by the value plus the free cash flow in the last year. And it turns out that our implied long-term growth rate is 12.56%, which is very high, but it's still below the cost of equity. So it's a feasible value. This concludes this example, which uh, demonstrate um, many different aspects of valuation. We'll conclude the chapter here. I'll see you again very soon in the next chapter.